Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to go ahead and get started here with module one. So the first thing we're going to talk about is some of the cryptographic primitives that allow the RSA, the public key encryption algorithm to work. So one of the basic and most important factors of RSA are prime numbers and also something called co-prime numbers. So we're going to talk a little bit about what those two things are. Prime numbers are probably exactly what you would expect. A uh, prime number is any number whose only factors are one and itself. And we say that if a number is not prime, if it has any factors or not just itself and one, then we call that number composite. So given two examples here, we know that number, uh, the number 17 is a prime number because no other numbers less than 17 uh, go into 17 evenly. So its only factors are one and 17. However, the number eight is a composite number. We know that it's not prime because it has two sets of factors. Of course, every number has one in itself um, as a set of factors, but we can also make eight by multiplying two times four. So hopefully this is familiar to you. Uh, but what you may not have heard before is what does it mean for two or potentially more numbers to be co-prime to one another? So two numbers are co-prime. Uh, another term we can use is the numbers are relatively prime to each other if they don't share any common factors. Okay, so this really speaks to the primality between two numbers. Um, in order for two numbers to be co-prime or relatively prime, the two numbers themselves don't necessarily have to be prime. They could both be prime, they could both be composite, or um, you could have one number prime and one number composite. That part doesn't matter. Um, so I've given an example here, five and nine are co-prime to one another. So five is a prime number, its only factors are one and five. And nine is a composite number, its factors are one, three, and nine. But notice that nine and five don't share any factors other than one. So that makes the two numbers uh, co-prime to each other. And so one way we like to denote this mathematically, we'll say that the greatest common denominator, so the GCD of five and nine is equal to one. And that's the same thing as saying mathematically that two numbers are co-prime to each other. Something I'm trying to do differently this semester throughout the course of the lecture slides, I want to try to throw in some exercises so that we can kind of help reinforce your understanding before moving on to the next topic. So see here, I provided four exercises dealing what we just spoke about on the last slide, which were prime and co-prime numbers. So if you're watching on a computer, hopefully you're not listening in the car, otherwise you won't be able to do this, I guess, but just go ahead and you can pause the video here. I'll wait a couple seconds. Feel free to work out the solutions to the four questions, and then we'll talk about the solutions on the very next slide. Okay, so hopefully you've gotten a chance to arrive at your four solutions, and we'll go ahead and talk about the, the answers now together. So the question was, is the number 83 prime? The answer to that is definitely yes. Um, 83, by definition of prime numbers, only factors are one in itself. So no other numbers evenly divide 83 that are not one or 83. So since the only factors are one and itself, then by definition, yes, 83 is prime. For the second question, I gave you a tremendously large number that I pretty much just generated at random, but there was one key thing I was hoping you would notice, and that was that the last number, the last digit in that large number is even. Of course, any even number by definition is not prime because we know that two divides evenly into all even numbers. Therefore, since no even numbers is prime, are prime, and this number is definitely even, then we know for sure the answer is no, this really large number is not prime. The question number three was asking you if 17 and 34 are co-prime to one another. The answer to that is actually no, 17 and 34 actually share the number 17 as a factor. And so recall that two numbers are co-prime if they don't share any factors. In other words, 17 and 34 are relatively prime to one another if their greatest common denominator is one. And just to touch again on what I said on the previous slide, being co-prime says nothing about the numbers individually themselves being prime. It only talks about the relationship, do they share any common factors? 
So despite the fact that 17 is prime and 34 is composite, we still see that these numbers are not relatively prime because they both share 17 as a factor. And then finally, question number four, the answer is yes, these numbers are actually coprime. If we factor four, we find that it has three factors, one, two, and four. Of course, 101 is an odd number, so there's no way that two goes into it. And similarly, since it's odd, uh, well, four can't go into it because four is just a power of two. So the only numbers that 101 and four share as a common factor is the number one. As we discussed on the previous slide, that's precisely the definition for two numbers to be coprime. So since 101 and four, their greatest common denominator is one, we say that yes, definitely, those two numbers are coprime or relatively prime to one another. Now that we've talked about prime numbers and coprime numbers, we're going to talk a little bit about something called modular arithmetic. So you may or may not have seen this before, but fortunately it's a pretty simple concept. So another term you might hear for modular arithmetic sometime, a nice way to think about it is as being clock math. So if you think of a clock, you have the number 12 at the top, and hour by hour you go through sequentially, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And then when you get to the 13th hour, well, there's no 13 on the clock, it just restarts at 12 again, and then cycles back through the numbers again. So that's basically what modular arithmetic is. And we write it, um, R is equal to A modulo B. So A mod B, we also say A modulo B. And R is really just the remainder that you get when you divide A by B. So I gave an, an example here, two <clears throat> uh, hopefully simple examples. 12 mod 7 or 12 modulo 7 is equal to 5 because when we divide 12 by 7, 7 goes into 12 one time with a remainder of 5. So that's simply it. 12 mod 7 is 5. And 18 mod 0, it's the remainder when 18 is divided by 9. So 9 goes into 18 twice, and it divides 18 evenly, so there is a remainder of 0. Okay? So hopefully that's clear. And then we'll also talk about what it means to be uh, for two numbers to be congruent when taken modulo n. And what we mean by that is if you take each number a and b and calculate them modulo n, the remainder should be equal. Okay, so it's written here, you can see in mathematical symbols, uh, a is congruent to b mod n, and I've given two examples of that below at the bottom. Uh, sorry, just one example at the bottom. So 6 mod 4 is remainder when 6 is divided by 4. So 4 goes into 6 once with the remainder of 2. And we're going to do the same thing with 18. We're going to take 18 mod 4. So that's the remainder when 18 is divided by 4. So 4 goes into 18 four times with a remainder of 2. So since they both have the same result, so the same remainder, when taken modulo 4, we say that 6 is congruent to 18 mod 4. So far we've talked about what it means for a number to be prime. We talked about what it means for two numbers to be relatively prime to one another. And we also introduced modular arithmetic. We're going to take that one step further. Now we're going to talk about something called modular exponentiation. So modular exponentiation is one of the, the beautiful primitives used in RSA. And we take a number and we raise it to an exponent. And then we compute the, the modulus as we did in the previous slide. So I've tried to uh, provide a pretty simple example here. We see 5 to the second power mod 4. So 5 squared is 25. And 25 mod 4, again, it's the remainder after dividing 25 by 4. So 4 goes into 25 six times, which equals 24. So there's a remainder of 1. So modular exponentiation is as straightforward as it seems. We compute the exponent first and then the modulus. But then I have another example here. Uh, 5 to the 100th power mod 7. Obviously, that becomes much, much, much harder. That's not something we can do in our head. It's not something we're able to really do on a calculator. 
uh, probably we would need a computer to be able to compute that exponent for us and then do the, the mod operation. So when that exponent becomes large, it becomes much more difficult to be able to brute force what that exponent was. And as we'll see, these exponents, which are either 512 bits, 1024 bits, or even 2048 bits, that, that number, that modular exponentiation is going to get really difficult. So uh, that's one of the beautiful things. That's how we get our public and private key when using RSA. So the question becomes, is there a shortcut method to be able to compute these uh, modular uh, exponentiation operations when that exponent is very large? So the answer to that, of course, is yes, as you probably guessed. So there's a method called fast modular exponentiation, which I'm going to show you a demo of on the next slide. Modular exponentiation is an important operation mathematically when we try to do RSA encryption. So I wanted to work through an example here and show you a quick method, what we call fast modular exponentiation that we can use with large exponents. And this will become useful down the line when we take a deeper look into RSA. So I'll start with a, a very simple example. Let's say we wanted to calculate six to the second power mod seven. Okay, this is pretty easy because we know that 6 squared is just 36. And then 36 mod 7, right, oops, excuse me, just equals 1. So that was pretty straightforward. We perform the exponentiation first, and then we reduce it modulo 7. And this case turns out to be pretty easy because this exponent here is small. So let me show you an example of a larger exponent. Let's say we wanted to solve for <clears throat> 5 to the 40th power mod 7. 5 to the 40, we probably need a calculator to do it, and a calculator might not even have enough memory to be able to store that result. A computer could potentially work, but this is definitely something that we have a hard time doing in our head. And these exponents can, uh, in practice, be much, much larger than just 40. So is there a shortcut? Is there a faster way we can accomplish this? And the answer is yes. So we'll start by looking at uh, 5 to the first power, 5 to the 1 mod 7. This is easy to compute because it's just the remainder when 5 is divided by 7, and this just equals 5. So now let's take a look at 5 squared mod 7. Well, this is pretty easy, too, because we know that 5 squared is 25. And 25 mod 7, the remainder after 25 is divided by 7, is 4. Okay, but quickly, this starts to get hard. Now we're going to look at 5 to the 4th mod 7. And we're actually going to use the result from the previous step. Uh, recall that we can write 5 to the 4th. Algebraically, we can rewrite that as 5 squared squared mod 7. Well, we know what 5 squared mod 7 is from the previous step. That was just 4. So we're going to go ahead... <clears throat> and plug a 4 in here, which is going to give us 16 mod 7. And that just equals 2. Okay, so let's look at the next power of 2. We're going to use, uh, we're going to have 5 to the 8 here. 5 to the 8 mod 7. And we know that 5 to the 8 is the same thing as 5 to the 4th squared mod 7. And again, we have this result of 5 to the 4th right here from the previous step. So we're going to take the 2 and plug it in here for 5 to the 4th. Okay. So 2 squared is 4 mod 7. 
and 4 mod 7 is simply 4. Okay, so hopefully you're starting to see the pattern here. We're going to do 5 to the 16th. We're going to use a result from the previous step, which is 4 squared mod 7, which is simply equals 16 mod 7, and that equals 2. Okay, we'll go one more power of 2 up. We'll compute 5 to the 32. Again, we're just going to plug in the result from the previous step, which is a 2. So 2 squared mod 7. It's 4 mod 7, which equals 4. Okay, so hopefully you can see the, the pattern there. <clears throat> now recall initially we wanted to compute 5 to the 40th mod 7 so how does this help us now hopefully you can remember back from I guess maybe algebra pre-calculus days if you have x to the a sorry I'm having a little trouble with my pen here x to the a times x to the b, when we have a common base here, we can add the exponents. So x to the a times x to the b is equal to x to the a plus b. Okay. Well, since we want to find 5 to the 40th power, we can use these two entries right here, 8 and a 32 because uh, 5 to the 8th times 5 to the 32 is 40, and then we can just take that re result, reduce it modulo 7, and that will give us our overall answer to 5 to the 40 mod 7. <clears throat> okay. So we know that 5 to the 32 mod 7 times 5 to the 8th mod 7 is equal to 5 to the 40. Also reduce modulo 7, which is exactly the answer that we're looking for. So now we're just going to go ahead and plug in. We know that 5 to the 32 mod 7 here was 4. And we know that 5 to the 8 mod 7 from up here was also 4, so 4 times 4, and we reduce that mod 7. That, of course, equals 16 mod 7, and 16 mod 7 we can easily compute 16 divided by 7 is 2 with a remainder of 2. And there's our final answer. Next, we're going to talk about a theorem that was developed by Fermat hundreds of years ago. It's called Fermat's Little Theorem, not to be confused with Fermat's Last Theorem. Fermat's Little Theorem is probably a little bit simpler than it looks. And it says that if P is a prime number, then a to the P minus A is an integer multiple of P. And here's how we write that mathematically. If we were to add a factor of A to both sides of the equation, we would get A to the P is congruent to A when taken modulo P. So it sounds like there's a lot going on, but it's important to know, you know, why is this useful? So here's an example. If we wanted to know, let's say you gave me a random number P, and you didn't know if it was prime or not, but you wanted me to try to tell you whether or not it was a prime number. This theorem says here that 
if p is prime, then some number a raised to the p is going to be congruent to a when taken mod p. So let's say you gave me the number p equals 3, and you wanted to know whether or not p was a prime number. I can select a random value a, so let's say a is equal to 2 and p is equal to 3. Okay, so I'm going to plug them into the equation above there. So we're going to get, uh, we want to know is 2 to the third congruent to 2 when taken mod p. So a to the p is 2 to the third, so 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. So we then take 8 and calculate it modulo p. So since p was 3, we're going to do 8 mod 3. And 3 goes into 8 two times with a remainder of 2. Okay? So on the left side, we get a to the p mod p is equal to 2. Now we look on the right side of the congruence, and we have a mod p. Well, a was 2, and p is 3, so we're going to compute 2 mod 3 on the right-hand side of the equation. Well, 2 divided by 3 is 0 with a remainder of 2. So now we got a 2 on both sides, and we know that in fact 2 to the third is congruent to 2 when taken mod p. And by definition of the theorem, that's only true if p is a prime number. So you basically have a probabilistic test to tell whether a given number is prime or not. So hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, if not, we can definitely talk about it a little bit more during office hour. I can give you a worked example of why this works. And we're going to see a little bit later on how this is one of the fundamental theorems. It's one of the uh, things using the proof of why an RSA crypto system is secure. So that leads us into a discussion on Euler's phi function, also sometimes called the totient function, and we denote it by using phi of n. This is actually fairly simple and straightforward. Phi of n just denotes the number of numbers that are less than n that are also co-prime or relatively prime to n. Okay, so mathematically I've written uh, Euler's theorem there. We're, we're going to get to that in a little bit. But let's take a look at the example here. We're going to calculate phi of n. So we're going to calculate the Euler totient function where n is equal to 16. Okay, so again, by the definition of the totient function, we're looking for the number of numbers that are less than 16 that are also relatively prime to 16, which means they share no other factors with 16 except for 1. Okay? So 1, we always count uh, towards Euler's totient. Okay, what about 2? Well, 2 is not relatively prime to 16 because they both share 2 as a factor. Uh, well, let's see, 3. Well, 3 doesn't go into 16, so that, that's relatively prime to 16. How about 4? Well, 4 and 16, they definitely share factors, right? 2 and 4 both go into the number 4, and 2 and 4 are both factors of 16. So 4 is not relatively prime. So 5 is relatively prime. 6 and 16 share a factor of 2, so it is not relatively prime and so on. So 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15, those are all the numbers that are relatively prime to 16. And the phi function just simply counts the number of numbers that are relatively prime in, to n and less than n. So if we count up the numbers that are relatively prime there, we see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 numbers. Um, therefore, and here's a very important fact, and we're going to use this fact later on when we talk a little bit more about RSA algorithm itself. If n is a prime number, then we know for sure that phi of n is just very simply equal to n minus 1. And so why is that true? Think of a, think of a prime number, let's just say 7. Well, we know that 7, the only factors it has are 1 and 7 by definition of it being prime. So since it's a prime number, its only factors are 1 and 7. That means that every number less than 7 is guaranteed to be 
relatively prime to seven. So we're going to count it in the phi function, right? So we know if the number is seven, we know that one, two, three, four, five, and six are all relatively prime to seven because by definition, seven is a prime number and it has no other factors except for one and seven. So very simply, if n is prime, then phi of n is always equal to n minus one. So it's very, very straightforward. So the number 17, for example, 17 is a prime number. So we know every number less than 17 is relatively prime to 17. So phi of 17 is just 16. So that's an important fact, so keep that in mind. And another nice fact is Euler's phi function is actually multiplicative. And what that means is if we uh, are trying to calculate phi of p times q, we can decompose that into the product of phi, t phi p times phi q. So let's assume though that we've chosen p and q both to be prime numbers, which we will do in RSA. Okay, well we know phi of p is just p minus one because p is prime. And we know that phi of q is just q minus one because q is prime. So by using the fact above, if p and q are prime, phi of pq, as you see here, is just simply p minus one times q minus one. Well, now that we talked about Fermat's little theorem, we're gonna talk about Euler's theorem. The Euler's theorem is just a little bit of a generalization of Fermat's little theorem. Um, so the nice thing about it is it lifts the restriction that P must be prime. So an example here, I've changed P to be N, uh, which hopefully doesn't make much difference. But what it does say is that it says if N and A are co-prime, so A and N share no factors other than one, then a to the phi of n is congruent to one when taken modulo n. So if we take a look at the left-hand side of that equation, you'll see that phi of n, that's exactly what we saw on the previous slide, which is Euler's totient function or the phi function. So if a and n are co-prime, what we see here is that because a to the phi of n is congruent to one mod n, that actually is the same thing as saying a to the phi of n is relatively prime to n. And we're gonna see a worked example. I know that's a lot of words to take in up front, but anytime you have something on the left-hand side, it doesn't matter what it is, let's just call it x. If x, so anything, is congruent to one when taken mod n, by definition, that means that x is relatively prime to that n. Again, we're gonna see some more examples of this later. We're gonna see it on the homework. Uh, we'll talk about it in office hours. So you know, don't get, don't get caught up uh, too much in the words. But I wanna point out a very interesting fact and why this is important. And this is really what I would like you to take away from it. Um, so as I just said, when a number A could be, again, anything, whatever's on the left-hand side, doesn't matter what it is. Could be a very complex term, could be a very simple term. If A is congruent to one mod N, Again, that means that A is relatively prime to N. But there's this other fun fact that if that's the case, then there exists a unique inverse, which we'll call B in this case, so that when you multiply A times B, that's also going to be uh, equal to 1, so congruent to 1 mod N. And the cool thing about this is that inverse B um, is actually guaranteed to exist if A is congruent to one mod N. So not only is it guaranteed, we know an inverse exists. We actually also know that a unique such inverse exists. So hopefully you might be able to start to see the connection between public and private keys here. So if we took A to be our uh, public key, and we know that A is congruent to one mod N, well, what this is saying is that there positively exists a single unique key that is the inverse of A when taken mod N. So that inverse is exactly your private key. That's what's gonna be able to undo the encryption. So after we encrypt using A as an exponent, we're gonna decrypt using B, and we have this nice mathematical fact that only one B exists. Um, so there's your public-private key pair right there. So we'll develop this idea a little bit more in some of the slides to come, but basically your major takeaway here should be 
um, that when a number is congruent to one mod n, there exists a unique, what we call modular multiplicative inverse b, such that a times b is congruent to one when taken mod n. With these ideas in mind now, we're gonna take a look at actually how RSA itself works. So the first step in the RSA algorithm, you're gonna begin by selecting two prime numbers, p and q. So you're gonna see a really nice example of this that you'll get a chance to work through on the homework. The numbers will be much smaller for p and q, so n will be much smaller. But in practice, p and q are usually 1024 or 2048-bit prime numbers, so they're, they're very, very, very large. But we'll just be dealing with a very small subset of numbers here just for e's sake. So start by selecting, relatively, uh, selecting prime numbers, p and q, and then we're going to set capital N, which is going to be our modulus, equal to p times q. Okay, and if you remember from a couple slides back, we're going to be using the phi function. Remember that the phi function is multiplicative. So when we go to calculate phi of n, we're going to be able to make phi of n is going to be the same thing as phi of p times q, because n is just equal to p times q. And then we can split that apart since it is multiplicative. So we'll get that that equals phi of n is equal to phi of p times phi of q. And then also recall that since both numbers p and q are prime, phi of p is just equal to p minus 1. So phi of q is just equal to q minus 1. So phi of n is going to be the product of p minus 1 times q minus 1. So next we're going to choose an encryption exponent. So we started to touch on this when we looked at Euler's generalization of Fermat's little theorem on the last slide. Okay, we're going to choose an encryption exponent, which we'll call E. And we're going to choose it such that the greatest common denominator, the GCD of E and phi of n is equal to 1. And remember from the last slide, what we said was that um, if the greatest common denominator of two numbers is equal to 1, that means that those two numbers are relatively prime. So what this is saying is we're going to choose an encryption exponent, uh, E, that is relatively prime to phi of n. Okay, and we can choose that to be uh, whatever we want it to be as long as E is relatively prime to phi of n. And the other thing to remember from the previous slide is we said if something is congruent to 1, mod n, which this is, that means that they're relatively prime, but it also means that E has a unique inverse when taken mod phi of n. In other words, there's going to exist a decryption exponent d such that d times E is equal to 1 mod phi of n. Okay, and that's the important thing that guarantees that a unique modular multiplicative inverse exists and that's going to be our decryption key. Okay, this follows from Euler's theorem, which we saw on the previous page, but uh, there's no need to go into a proof. This isn't a formal number theory class, but if it's something you're interested, let me know. I'd be happy to show it during office hour or point you to it. It's not a very difficult proof at all, fortunately. Okay, so uh, we start with a message M that we're looking to encrypt. And you see here, C, so that's going to be the ciphertext. That's going to be the encrypted message. The encrypted message is simply the message M. So let's just say for simplicity's sake that that's just some number. M raised to the E power, which we just chose our encryption exponent so that it's relatively prime to phi of N. And then we just take that number and compute it mod N. So this is just simply the modular exponentiation that we saw about four or five slides back. Okay, and then to decrypt, we actually just do the opposite process. So we start with the ciphertext C. So we sent this to someone. Uh, I'm sorry, um, they sent us a message encrypted with our public key, which is E. Right, they sent us the ciphertext back. And the only thing in the world that's able to undo that encryption is D. Because as you saw above, we know that there is one and only one unique uh, modular multiplicative inverse of E mod phi of n, which is D. Okay, so when we take that ciphertext C and raise it to the D power, when we take that result mod n, again, this is just uh, straightforward modular exponentiation, 
that's actually going to yield the original message. Okay, so we're going to take a look at a worked example of that and we'll step through it together. Now we're going to step through an example of the RSA algorithm together so you can get a better feel for how some of these number theoretic primitives actually lead up to the successful encryption and decryption of data using RSA. So recall the first step is to choose two numbers P and Q that are prime. So for <clears throat> our example here, we'll use smaller numbers just for the sake of learning. So we'll select, let's say P is equal to 11. And we'll say that Q is equal to 13. The next step is to compute the modulus, uh, capital N, which is just simply P times Q. And 11 times 13 is 143. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate Euler's phi function. So we want to calculate phi of n, which is 143. But recall that it's a multiplicative function, which just means we can decompose this into 511 times 513. That's just 5p times 5q. And we know by definition that since both P and Q, 11 and 13, are prime numbers, we know that this just equals P minus 1, which is 10, times Q minus 1, which is 12. So 5N is simply equal to 120. Okay, so our next step here is we want to choose an encryption in exponent such that the, ex the encryption exponent, which we'll call E, is relatively prime to 5n. So we want to choose a number E that's relatively prime to 120. So let's just go ahead and we will say, we'll select E, our encryption exponent is equal to 7. Okay. So now what we need to do, thanks to Euler's theorem, we know that there exists a D such that D times 7 is congruent to 1 when taken mod n. Okay, so there's a, an algorithm here. And the algorithm is called extended Euclidean algorithm. Okay, and that extended Euclidean algorithm is going to yield a value uh, d for us such that d when multiplied by 7 is going to be congruent to 1 mod 143. Okay, so I'm not going to step through the math of that right here, but I will tell you that D is going to be equal to 103. Okay. So now we have our encryption exponent E. We have our decryption exponent D. So now we're ready to encrypt and decrypt a message. Okay. So let's say, for example, we wanted to encrypt the number 9. Okay, the way we do that, we take our uh, message equals 9. So 9 raised to the encryption exponent mod n is going to equal the ciphertext. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in for you. So that's going to be 9 to the 7th. mod 143. Okay, and using the fast modular exponentiation method that we saw earlier on, and then the help of a calculator to do the mod operation, 9 to the 7 mod 143 is actually equal to 48. Okay, so this 48 here, this is our encrypted value 
This is the encrypted value of 9 when we use this e equals 7 as our encryption exponent. Okay, so the person takes our public key e, they encrypt a message for us, they encrypt the number 9, they get 48, and then they send 48 to us over the internet. So we receive the number 48 and we need to decrypt it. So that's perfectly fine. We know that we have our decryption key here, which we just called D, and D is guaranteed to be the inverse. So it should be able to perform the decryption operation for us. So it's just the opposite. We take the message C, which is 48, and we raise it to the D power, 103. And again, we just take this mod N, which is mod 143. So we can use the fast modular exponentiation algorithm on here, which I won't step through. Um, you'll see a simpler example of it on the homework. So we do the modular exponentiation there, and then we use a calculator to take that result, mod 143, and as we'd expect, we get back the original message, m equals 9. So as you can see, this checks out. The value that we decrypted is precisely equal to the value that was um, encrypted publicly using our, our public key exponent E. So we're able to get back the original message, and that's exactly how RSA works.